He was a major player at the two-day Paris Climate Finance Summit that's just concluded. Former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is Joe Biden's special presidential envoy for climate. Thank you for joining us here on France 24. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, lots to talk about coming out of these two days. But first, I got to say, Americans don't do half measures. Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris climate deal and then... Uh, Joe Biden uh, not only goes back in, but uh, goes in with this huge uh, energy, green investment plan, huge subsidies, hundreds of billions uh, uh, of dollars, which, by the way, have attracted uh, investors from around the globe. Yep, they have. It, well, you know, it's, I don't think it's a definition of what Americans do. I think that it's a definition of what happens when you have somebody who is, you know, out of touch completely and doesn't inform themselves and who makes a decision based on God knows what. Pulling out of the Paris Agreement was really hurtful for America, but in the end, Americans stayed in the agreement. All across our country, the American people wanted to continue to make progress, and we did. And even during Donald Trump's tenure, uh, about 75% of all the new electricity that came online in the United States was from renewables. That's a remarkable story. And so I would, I like to, you know, Donald Trump may have pulled out of it, but the American people stayed in. And now President Biden is making up for that with a remarkable set of uh, uh, initiatives that are helping to make a difference in terms of the meetings we've had in the last two years in Glasgow, Sharm el Sheikh. And now we're working to try to make a difference. Yeah, that tomorrow. energy transition uh, bill, the, the, known as the Inflation Reduction Act, yes, sir. It, it turbocharges. Uh, we hope so. And yes, there's evidence that it's really having a good impact. Now, uh, the jury's still out because there's been a bit of a subsidy war now that's born of that but with Europe, uh, uh, yeah. most notably. And th that's you know, the, the, everybody needs to, to 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 get their 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 energy transition in high gear. But is that taking money away from those countries that were present at this summit? Uh, if you're building a seawall or solar panels, would you rather send your money to the United States or to West Africa? Well, I don't think it's an either or. It's not a binary choice. The fact is that uh, uh, President Biden has energized, no pun intended, efforts in America in order to do our part, because it's a global effort. Every country needs to be at the table. And President Biden's making certain that the United States is going to meet its goals. But, but the investment money is finite. Yeah. But no, <laughs> actually... Uh, there are trillions of dollars waiting to be invested. That's what President Macron was addressing in this particular conference, is how do we take those trillions of dollars and excite them to get into the marketplace now in developing uh, economies, emerging economies. And, uh, you know, but, but those economies, by the way, are not where the problem of the climate crisis is emanating from. There are 20 countries, the largest economies in the world, that are responsible for almost 80 percent of all the emissions that are creating the problem. So what, what the president, what President Macron is trying to do, and all of us are trying to do, is find a way to get the trillions of dollars needed for this energy transition to be deployed, to be invested, so that we accelerate the transition. And, and the president, President Macron, assembled about $37 trillion of assets owned and managed in the one room listening to how we can come together to deploy some of that money. So we need to de-risk. We need to help that money feel more comfortable in being invested in some of these but, uh, trickier places. But again, these are not charities. These are private no, companies or, or sovereign yeah. wealth funds, and they want a return on their buck. And they will get a return on their buck. That's the whole point. But what we need to do is get the fear out of the atmosphere and address some of their concerns. And there are concerns. You know, is the, is, the, is the legal system such that we can arbitrate or take care of a problem if there is a problem? Uh, will our money be safer here than it might be somewhere else? Uh, there are currency challenges. There are political challenges. So everybody has to kind of step up and begin to take the risk factor out of those investments and help deploy that money. A lot of different suggestions were put on the table in the last uh, 48 hours, and, and I think uh, 
it was really interesting, actually, hearing from a lot of the leaders from Africa and Latin America and elsewhere who came here uh, to have this discussion. Yeah, and when it comes to investing and borrowing, a major player is China, represented by its prime minister uh, at, at this conference. Uh, you exchanged with Li Keqiang? We had a very brief uh, hello and an opportunity to say hi uh, uh, as we were moving in and out of the thing. I didn't have a formal meeting, but uh, it was worthwhile, and I'm glad I was able to have a brief discussion with him. Climate is one issue where both President Xi and President Biden have said we should not be the prisoners of other issues that we are concerned about and we have differences on. We need all of us to deal with the climate challenge. So my hope is that that will open up an opportunity for China and the United States to cooperate again, as we were last year and before, uh, in order to try to accelerate the transition. Uh, the, one of the m big issues China was involved in this is uh, how to get over the line debt restructuring. There's some 50 countries in the world uh, that are either in default or close to it. And uh, after coming out of COVID and with inflation that's gone up these past years, uh, there was a deal on the sidelines for Zambia, uh, and it, again, this involved in, in, in part China. Uh, is it something, though, when you look at the, uh, uh, the task at hand, how, how do you stop these countries from falling back into a debt trap? The debt trap is, is a serious concern, and we all share uh, a, a recognition that the current policies of the World Bank, of the multilateral development banks, IMF, et cetera, they need to be fine-tuned. They need to be brought into this moment, 2023 climate crisis, and the need to be able to uh, liberate these countries from, from the amazing burden that they have at certain times. For instance, if you have a massive hurricane or a cyclone or a huge flood like in Pakistan, if you're burdened with greater debt, you can't respond. You can't take care of the people. And you can't do the things you need to do to move forward on avoiding those crises in the future. Those For institutions... Instance, adapting, hardening your, your defenses. Those institutions you talk about, of course, they answer to their shareholders, the largest ones the United States, for That's both the World Bank exactly and the IMF. That's exactly why you need this meeting. Because you need to address the legitimate concerns of people whose money that they have in a fund comes from people who expect you to make money or at least protect their money. You have pensioners. Pension funds are invested. You can't put pension funds at risk in, a, in an investment where you don't have an adequate sense of fiduciary uh, confidence that it's going to be But the protected. criticism leveled at the United States is that mm. it's, it's, uh, there should be a recapitalization. There needs to be more money for the IMF and Well, there are ways Bank. to, yeah, but there are ways. You, and to do that, does that mean the U.S.'s uh, share I, I, at the board is diluted? There is, at this point in time, no one's judgment that I've heard who's involved in this world of finance and efforts to try to fix the MDBs, the multilateral development banks, who is saying we need a new capital infusion. What we need is to use the existing rules to their fullest capacity in order to be able to lend more money. And you can lend more money without having a capital infusion. If you, if you, I mean, there have been very tough restraints on the way in which the banks have behaved, which don't, if you get rid of them, those restraints, it doesn't threaten your AAA rating. So what people want to do is try to first move to unleash these banks from restrictive interpretations of existing rules. Then, after that, if we don't have enough, maybe it'll be time to consider whether you need a capital. Because you need a lot. You talked about trillions you yourself. Yes, and you and, and uh, you need they, four there's trillion a recent. So, uh, every year for the next seven years and maybe beyond. And at least one trillion of that has to go to the developing world. Uh, I think more, more than that may go to the developing world. But uh, the developing world right now would be hard-pressed to be able to produce the projects that are going to take a full trillion dollars. But over a period of time, that will accelerate, and you'll be able to use a significant amount of this money on this transition. But, but part of it, this is important. Twenty major economies of the world equal 80 percent of all the emissions. 
those 20 countries are pretty developed. And so they need to be taking, uh, 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 you know, steps to address their transition. Many of them are. The EU, UK, uh, Japan, Korea, Canada, the United States, all of those entities have adopted plans that, if they implement them, can keep the 1.5 degree target in range. About 10 countries have not yet raised their ambition to a level that actually keeps faith with the Paris Accord, the Paris are you, Agreement. Are you including China in that? Uh, China still has to raise some ambition, even as China has done an amazing job of deploying more renewables than anyone else in the world. So China's moving very rapidly to, to try to transition, but we believe there are ways for us to work together to try to be able to do more. And, and, and I hope, because China and the United States together equal about 40 percent of all the emissions, if we can't cooperate together, it's really going to be hard to be able to reach the goal. Did Joe Biden make your life a little more difficult this week by calling Xi Jinping a dictator? Well, look, I do, I, we do not get involved in the back and forth. Uh, my counterpart in China, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, is a friend. We work together for 20, 25 years. We know each other. We trust each other. It's important to stay away from whatever the political back and forth is. We want to find a way to change this dynamic, to have climate crisis turn into something that could actually, between China and the United States, open up the opportunities for us to work together on other things, too. John Kerry, two quick final questions. First of all, what do you say to developing nations who argue that uh, they see the United States going all in uh, behind Ukraine? How come uh, the same kind of amount of uh, money generated, the wartime economy mentality, isn't happening for the developing world here for these sustainable goals? Well, I've argued that it should be, and uh, I'm in favor of treating this particular challenge right now as if we were at war, because I think we have to organize ourselves in our countries far more effectively to deploy the resources that we have today and to begin to develop the technologies and the resources we need to win this battle. This is a big challenge. A lot of people sort of treat it indifferently or, or they don't think they can make a difference. Everybody can make a difference in this. And we need everybody to be engaged in this challenge. We have to, you know, we have to uh, get electricity to people who don't have it. We need to use the electricity we have today to decarbonize our societies. Or we have to capture the carbon that is uh, the, 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 uh, the egregious um, part of uh, creating this, this uh, challenge that we all face of the warming of the planet, et cetera. It comes from one thing. It comes from the emissions that come from the burning of fossil fuels that are not trapped, caught. And, and, and if we don't catch them, then we're going to continue to add to this problem. So it's not a, this is not a rocket science challenge. We don't have to sit around and scratch our heads and say, what's right. doing this? We know what's doing this. It's the way we propel our vehicles, the way we heat our homes, the way we uh, light our, our studios and our, 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 our homes and factories. That's what has to change. It has to become carbon free. And the faster we get there, the better chance we have of avoiding the worst consequences. Uh, in the meantime, my brother this summer is going to be hosting me at his uh, seaside home in Brittany, where it rains a lot. He's joked that uh, we'll soon be refugee climates, uh, c c uh, ret climate refugees at his house. I know you have longstanding ties to Brittany. I do. Uh, is it going to be the new Saint-Tropez? Well, it certainly is uh, a, a place to escape the unbearable heat and to find a terrific climate for... Uh, the summertime, there's no question about that. Uh, it's hot in a lot of places, and that heat is going to drive people to other places. Uh, it already is in many parts of the world. In fact, we're losing literally millions of people to extreme heat in various parts of the world. We're losing 8 million people a year to the air pollution that comes from greenhouse gas emissions. So I think there are a lot of places that people will seek for refuge. It may well be. Uh, that Brittany is one, but I'm trying not to overcrowd it at this point. Right. We can help it. John Kerry, so many thanks for speaking with us here on Thank France you. 24. Thank you. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you for joining us here.
Welcome back to the newsroom. In this edition, the U.S. Coast Guard deems it was a catastrophic implosion that sank a tourist sub near the wreckage of the Titanic. This as questions mount over the seaworthiness of the Titan. At least 350 Pakistanis were on board that overcrowding fishing vessel that sank last week off of Greece. That's according to the government, which says the ringleader was based in Libya. Only 82 bodies recovered so far. Victor Mania sweeps San Antonio in earnest. The Spurs confirming the selection of Victor Wembanyama in the NBA draft. A first for a Frenchman, Wassim Cornet, will give us a live update from Western Texas. Hope had already faded before the U.S. Coast Guard deemed that it was indeed a catastrophic implosion that killed the five aboard the Titan. Uh, pieces of the small submersible, submersible were found some 500 meters from the bow of uh, the Titanic wreckage on the ocean floor in the North Atlantic. Uh, the five are being remembered. Nicholas Rushworth has more. All five people aboard the submersible that ventured to visit the wreck of the Titanic died in an implosion of the vessel in the ocean depths. Ocean Gate Expeditions, the company that organized their journey, said, Our hearts are with these five souls and every member of their families during this tragic time. Those on board the Titan submersible included the French submarine expert Paul-Henri Narjolet, he was nicknamed Mr. Titanic for his frequent dives at the site. One of his friends paid tribute to him. He's just consummate professional, you know, and um, aside from that, just very humble individual too, you know. He was, uh, in, in this domain, there are a lot of people with a lot of bluster and a lot of, uh, a lot of big egos to try to show what they've done and where they've been and what they've accomplished for exploration and things, and he was never like that. The Pakistani-British tycoon Shahzada Dawood and his son Solomon were members of Pakistan's most prominent families. The tycoon's interest centered on agriculture, petrochemicals and telecoms infrastructure. The Dawood Foundation said the immense love and support we receive continues to help us during our hour of need. The British businessman Hamish Harding was an adventurer who held three Guinness World Records. He was chairman of the aircraft brokering company Action Aviation, a statement on behalf of his family and the company said, What he achieved in his lifetime is truly remarkable, and if we can take any small consolation from this tragedy, it's that we lost him doing what he loved. Clearly the most critical Tributes have also been paid to Stockton Rush, Ocean Gate CEO and the pilot of the Titan. In the past, he described the trips in the vessel as bringing him the adventure he craved. He believed that the ocean is the universe. He argued, that is where life is. Yeah, the questions uh, over uh, uh, adventure tourism, uh, we'll be putting it to our Friday panel of journalists in the world this week in a little over 30 minutes' time. Pakistan's interior minister states that 350 Pakistani citizens were on board a ship that uh, sank last week off of the coast of uh, Greece. Only 82 bodies have been recovered from that overcrowding fishing vessel. Uh, the exact number on board ranging anywhere from uh, 450 to 700. Uh, for more, uh, we're uh, joined on set by uh, Lila Jacinto uh, from uh, France 24's uh, International News Desk. Uh, Lila, what else did the interior minister say? Well, he put a figure on it, uh, but he did say that uh, it was approximately 350 people had perished. And he said th those numbers could escalate dramatically, which means that the death toll, he told Parliament, could exceed any other disaster or act of terror uh, in Pakistani history. So this is, this, is a, this is a really huge loss of human life uh, in Pakistan. And Pakistanis are asking some pretty serious questions uh, of why this happened. This is not a country that is at war or in a conflict zone there is you know there is a political
political crisis, there is an economic crisis, but not in conflict. Now, Interior Minister uh, Rana Sa Sanaula also said that 280 families had reported uh, members missing. Now, when we're talking about families, each of these families could have more than one member missing, because what we have seen from this investigation and from Pakistani media reports is that this uh, this migration, uh, this move, uh, the flow of, of people happened in clusters. Uh, so in one family, you could have many family members. And geographically, it seems to ha have occurred in two regions of Pakistan. One was the Kotli district in uh, Pakistani-administered Kashmir, and the other is the city of Gujarat in the Punjab province. Now, the Punjab province is the country's most populous. It has dominated Pakistani politics. Punjabis are also uh, you know, disproportionately represented in the armed forces. So what we, you know, what Pakistanis are examining is these are not people fleeing persecution. Uh, and also the, the price that was paid. More details coming on that. Yeah, because uh, we're talking anywhere from 4500 to the equivalent of 8000 or $9,000 each. And if you do the math and there's hundreds on board. We're talking millions of dollars that have been pocketed by someone. Exactly. Uh, and, and before we get to that, that's millions of rupees that Pakistanis have, have, have paid to get on board per adult, which means this is not really a poor, not poor Pakistanis, but this is middle class flight uh, fr from the country. And as for the, the linchpins, the people making the money out of this, this is the interior minister. So he had some details uh, in parliament on, on the arrest. They have, uh, they have 27 suspects arrested right now. Among the suspects, they include uh, a, a, allegedly a big smuggler who was convicted in another case of sending men to uh, to Libya. These are mostly men, uh, but he was never charged and he was released soon after. So the Pakistani interior minister said that there is a problem with convictions. Uh, no one has been convicted so far. And what happens is the families make a settlement agreement. And so so charge, so convictions don't happen. And he promised to work on that. Another thing that, that he talked about was like, how are these people f fleeing? Apparently, they leave the country legally. Uh, you know, they get visas to countries such as the UAE, Egypt, and Libya. Uh, and once they are there, then they take boats illegally uh, onto Europe. So the Pakistani interior minister said that, he, you, you know, they are working with the, with the consulates of these countries uh, uh, to examine why visas are given uh, to, these, to these men who show no reason for actually going to these countries. And Pakistan, of course, is having a, a, a committee is conducting an investigation into this. And he promised uh, parliament that the, the recommendation will be implemented so that a tragedy on such a scale would not happen again. So 27 under arrest in Pakistan. That's on top of uh, the nine Egyptians uh, who are facing charges. In, in Greece, uh, Pakistan's uh, interior minister, who claims the ringleader, is from Libya. Indeed. So, you know, there's a, there are there are nexus of these human smugglers. Now, now so, uh, among these 27 who were arrested, four were in the capital, uh, Islamabad, and the rest came from Lahore, the capital uh, uh, of Punjab. That's where they hail from. So, you know, this is very much an urban phenomenon. There are people growing extremely rich with this, this trafficking. Mm. Leela Jacinto, many thanks. Um... In other news we're following for you, the curtains come down in Paris on a two-day summit to mobilize the trillions of dollars needed to accelerate the planet's energy transition. Leaders of dozens of developing nations calling for an overhaul of the World Bank International Monetary Fund, which they deem underfunded and too bureaucratic to meet this challenge. Kemi Knight has more. A restructuring of the global financial system to combat both climate change and poverty. It's an ambitious objective for the Paris summit, bringing together over 40 world leaders in the French capital and international financial institutions. The World Bank's vision has to evolve to say, yes, we will create a world free of poverty, but on a livable planet. The World Bank announced that developing countries would be able to pause their debt repayments if hit by a climate disaster. 
debt relief has been a key demand from poorer countries. And though the World Bank's pledge only applies to new loans, some progress has also been made in relieving at least a handful of countries of the debt that's been crippling their economies. We do have now the common framework delivering for Chad, for Zambia, and also countries outside of the common framework, Sri Lanka, Suriname, benefiting from bringing creditors, public and private, together. Resources. Zambia's lenders, including China, have agreed to restructure the country's $6.3 billion debt, covering about a third of the tab after the country defaulted following the COVID pandemic. The IMF says it's confident it has reached its target of making $100 billion available for vulnerable countries. It achieved this by allowing richer countries to rechannel some of their IMF special drawing rights to poorer countries in 2021. It was also an opportunity to share ideas, with French President Emmanuel Macron floating the possibility of global taxation on things like maritime transport and the aviation industry. I'm all for attacks on financial transactions against poverty and the climate. We're told we should tax plane tickets too. We've done it in France, but who else is doing it? It doesn't work when you do it alone. The summit has been a way of putting together a roadmap for leaders ahead of the COP28 summit in Dubai, taking place in December this year. Speaking of which, in China, scorching heat, record temperatures uh, felt in the capital for this time of year, above 40 degrees Celsius. Here in Beijing, residents do their best to keep cool in the midst of a heat wave which has struck the capital and parts of northern China. On Thursday, the temperature in the city exceeded 41 degrees Celsius, making it the hottest day in June since reliable records began and sparking concern among these tourists. Yes, I'm worried about the heat. Last mid-June, when it was this hot near Beijing, the power went out at noon. And because everyone turns on their aircon around that time, well, then there's a power cut in the whole village. It wasn't until 6 p.m. when it got cooler that the electricity was turned back on. I'm definitely worried. We don't go outside. We came out today, but we'll be leaving tomorrow. The figure recorded on Thursday is half a degree higher than the previous June record and the second highest in the city's history. The heat has struck at the same time as a public holiday known as the Dragon Boat Festival, which locals usually spend outdoors. But on Friday, Beijing upgraded its warning for hot weather to red, the highest in a colour-coded alert system, and urged the public to take refuge in the shade as much as possible. High temperatures are forecast to persist across swathes of northern China for the next 8 to 10 days. High temperature monitoring and warnings will continue on a rolling basis in the capital and the northwest. From the Paris suburb of Nanterre uh, to uh, the uh, uh, to the uh, arena in San Antonio, Texas, uh, Victor Wembayana has been confirmed as the first Frenchman drafted number one overall uh, in the NBA uh, picks uh, selections. The 19-year-old, the most coveted prospect since a certain LeBron James. Jaime Jamin has the story. This is the moment the 19-year-old star's life changed forever. The San Antonio Spurs select Victor Wembanyama from Nantar, France. Victor Wembanyama, the most hyped basketball prospect since LeBron James, selected as the number one pick in this year's NBA draft. Wild scenes followed on Thursday as the San Antonio Spurs finally got their man, a towering 2-meter 21 French forward with the world at his feet. And even though selection was a foregone conclusion, his reaction said it all. Can't really describe it, you know, still fresh. But uh, one of the best feeling of my life, you know. Probably the best night of my life. I've been dreaming about this for so long. It's just, it's a dream come true. It's incredible. The youngster comes with far more hype than most number one picks, dominating the French league in his final season with Mets 92. He led all players in scoring, rebounding and blocked shots. Now he's hoping to use his generational talent to become the centerpiece of a star-studded team. And he has the perfect mentor in coach Greg Popovich, who guided the Spurs to five championships. As I just said, he's Victor and that's who I want him to be and that's who myself and our staff will coach. I'm very excited.
you don't want me to jump up and down, do you? Put on a show for you? I'd do a somersault, but I'd be out for three months. The last two times Spurs got first pick, they hit the jackpot with future Hall of Famers David Robinson and Tim Duncan. Now starts the Wembenyama era, where anything on the court is possible. Well, let's go to Texas. Uh, Wasim Golne is our correspondent. Uh, are you feeling Victor Mania in San Antonio? I mean, Victor Mania, Wemby fever, uh, you know, people have now called this league the Wemby A. So lots of puns, lots of excitement. I think it's really hard to uh, understate the excitement that this that the city this, uh, of San Antonio has been feeling, the Spurs fans. I mean, just yesterday, we got here yesterday afternoon and we uh, spoke to so many fans. We saw murals that have been painted with Wemby uh, uh face on it. We've, saw, we've seen a, a, a cardboard cutout. Uh, we've seen several fans, you know, get special haircuts with Wembenyama's face on, on the, the back of their heads. And we've also seen uh, this thing called the Wemby Fever. So it's this restaurant, this pub that created this uh, this Wemby burger, rather, uh, with uh, Kobe beef, fried onions, and, of course, the French touch foie gras. Let me tell you, I'm not leaving San Antonio without getting a taste of that. But, uh, yeah, just a huge excitement for... Um, for the revival of the 19-year-old kid uh, born just southwest of Paris. Uh, we are at the at and Center right here, which is the Spurs home turf, and we uh, were able to speak to some of the fans this morning who were uh, got, were wanting to get their hands on the uh, Wemba Miyama jersey, and, uh, well, they're very excited. They said that they just could not wait for the start of the season, and we spoke to one of the store's general managers, and she said just last night, just at the at and Center where there was a draft watch party, they sold 1,200 jerseys that was just last night in the minutes following the official news that uh, Wembenyama was the number one uh, draft pick for the San Antonio Spurs. And uh, obviously they're expecting those numbers to climb in the uh, days and weeks ahead. We heard a clip in that report uh, of Coach Popovich. Uh, Wasim, I'm sure that uh, a fellow Frenchman Tony Parker has told Wembenyama that uh, it's not going to be a, a summer of rest and relaxation. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, you know, Wembenyama is currently on a plane right now. He will be landing in San Antonio this afternoon where there are already fans waiting at the airport. He will be meeting with some of the uh, the uh, highest ranking people of the San Antonio Spurs franchise for dinner tonight, presumably also meeting Coach Popovich, Popovich excuse me, for the first time. And then tomorrow morning, uh, we're trying to get official confirmation for that, but we are hearing rumors that there may be some kind of public event uh, with Spurs fans to officially give a uh, great big San Antonio welcome to Victor Wembanyama, followed by a press conference where he'll be, where he'll be speaking to uh, both American media and French media. The Spurs have received around 100 accreditation requests for different media from all over the world, so that is much more than they typically see. And then, of course, as you mentioned, no rest for the weary. Uh, there was uh, the, uh, the Wembenyama will be beginning his uh, training for the summer league, which begins uh, next month in Las Vegas. And then, of course, the official NBA season doesn't start until late October. But there will be lots of training. Uh, worth noting also that this tra new training will be happening at these new facilities, $500 million uh, new Spurs training facilities here in San Antonio. Wasim, well, make sure you expense that uh, uh, foie gras burger to, the, uh, to, to France 24. Thank, thanks for that live update from San Antonio. You bet. The Olympic Flames route has been unveiled here in Paris. And before it makes its way for the uh, opening ceremonies uh, next summer, it will be uh, passing through uh, iconic historical sites, such as uh, Joan of Arc's house, the Mont Saint-Michel Monastery, and iconic sporting sites, the top of uh, the Mont Blanc, the Mont Ventoux, where so many cycling greats have uh, fallen, and uh, uh, the roads of the Paris-Roubaix. For 68 days, the Olympic flame will crisscross France. From Mont Saint-Michel to the D-Day landing beaches, from the Lascaux Caves to Mont Ventoux and the Cannes Croisette. The country is rolling out the red carpet for the symbol of the Olympic Games. La flamme, the flame is above all a symbol, an idea, values, and our role will be to give it body and life thanks to the thousands of people who will make it shine. The Olympic flame will be lit on April 16th in Greece and arrive in France on May 8th before crossing more than 400 cities in five overseas territories 
to arrive in Paris on July 26. Its first port of call is Marseille, where the torch will be carried on the last French tall ship, Belém. Torch fever is already taking hold. In the Southern Alp Maritime Department, hundreds of school children stage their own mini Olympic Games. While in Strasbourg, residents welcome the news the flame relay will pass by the city on June 26. That's good. It's not just Paris. The Olympic Games are for everyone. The route includes many of France's iconic heritage sites, such as the 2,500-year-old medieval city of Carcassonne. The torch will also travel through the famed vineyards of Bordeaux. But some cities opted out due to the cost, 180,000 euros to host the flame. For less prosperous regions that were hoping for a tourist boost, it came as a bitter pill. The flame will end its nearly 12,000-kilometer journey in Paris on July 26th for the opening ceremony of the Games. A new gallery in the Paris suburb of Saint-Denis is giving pride of place to contemporary African art. Our own uh, Natasha Milleret went along. Oh, bienvenue chez Clapenmont. Bonjour, France 4 Venez. Claire Penouvon is a visual artist from Togo. It's here in his studio north of Paris that he keeps his precious materials. This is black plastic film. It's what they use to wrap pallets in trade. The pallet? A stretchy black plastic film he discovered at a local wholesaler's and which has become his signature. Claire Penouvon left Togo for France 30 years ago to follow his dream of being an artist. But on arrival in Seine-Saint-Denis, his first impression was the harshness of living conditions. Before I came to France, I didn't know I was black. But when I got here, I saw people like myself, the conditions they were living in, the jobs they were supposed to do, the roles they had to play here. They had to clean up the country, clean up the cities, and then go back to the suburbs. My dream was impossible. I had to admit that I was black. But if I admit that I'm black, then I can use it. An observation that's continued to fuel his work ever since. In 2015, the artist created the black film of Lampedusa, an installation made up of everyday objects wrapped in plastic, and a criticism of the indifference to the frequent migrant tragedies. Today, Claire Penouvon is continuing work on his black profile series, which he started four years ago. Right now, I'm welding pieces of plastic together. Each time I try to find different pieces, different shades of black, and I combine them to create new profiles. Glossy black, burnt black, matte, oily or velvet black, like many different facets of skin. Three black profiles are on show in this new Paris gallery as part of an exhibition devoted to the artists. Its name, Noir Total, or Total Black, refers to Africa's oil industry, as well as to the power of the continent's men and women. He manages to strike a balance with a very committed message, both politically and environmentally, but without it being presented as a political slogan. It's always very subtle and all the more powerful for that. And that, for me, is what makes his work so special. It's both minimalist and highly meaningful. His hues recall the work of Pierre Soulage. A comparison the artist embraces. I discovered Soulage through his idea, light springs from black. It's a line that touched me straight away. I felt like it was about me. But I couldn't paint with black because Soulage had already made it his own. Like Soulage's Beyond Black before, Claire Pouvon's Total Black reflects a glimmer of hope. Top of the hour, we'll have more news, and then it's the world this week. We'll talk about uh, adventure tourism gone wrong with that uh, wreckage off the Titanic. And 
Allied over shared values or their rivalry with China? The stakes of Narendra Modi's state visit to Washington. Those stories and more coming up in the world this week.